hey, look at that. It works. How do we want to compose it? Weird shell things? No, weird shell things. I don't like the weird shell things. So, I'm at the beach, true story. And I gotta click my screen recording here. Anyway, I wanna talk a little bit about what I've been learning. I've been reading a wonderful book called uh, uh, Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. Anyway, fantastic. Uh, not really gonna go into it, but just some really, I don't know, inspirational stuff, encouraging stuff, especially if you're a manager, which I am, so good. Good, good stuff to hear. And uh, it's all, of course, about creating Pixar, which is very exciting, and uh, yeah. So uh, what I want to talk about is my process in trying to figure out how to get this script for my first episode figured out. I've, I wrote it, and uh, my first one I wrote in probably, oh, I don't know, two, three weeks. And it just kind of flowed. I'd sit down and write six pages, six to ten pages sometimes. Uh, and it just came out. And I felt good about it. I liked it. And I had a number of people review it and give me feedback. And the feedback was mostly positive. Uh, with uh, the, the negative things just being fairly minor. Uh, a little, you know, what about this? Um, you know, is, is that peculiar thing really necessary to the story? No, it's not. So, well, maybe you should consider changing it so you don't distract from your point kind of stuff. Um, and I got it done. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to have a, episode two. And I want to go ahead and seriously consider shooting. I like, I, I want to shoot episode one, the pilot, right? And um, so I wrote episode two. Well, I started. I wrote the first 10 pages and then I couldn't keep going. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I didn't like what I'd written so far. And it probably went on like a month like that. And then one weekend, I sat down and I made myself write. And in two days, I finished my next uh, episode. These are about 50 page episodes. They're not crazy long, but um, I don't know. I was proud of it. it more than I ever wrote before. Um, but then I started uh, my process of getting a mentor who actually did film. And I had my, uh, my finance guy who actually loves writing scripts and uh, reading scripts and watching movies. Anyway, so I, I thought it would be interesting to get his feedback. And it was interesting because my two mentors and my finance guy all agreed. It was like 40% fluff. And I guess as I had more time away from the script, the more I could see what they were saying. I had stuff happening that felt really significant to me. Um, but one of the things I think was happening is that I wanted to create kind of an art house feel, very emotional, slow ch slow burn, I don't know, slow churn, I want to call it because it's not really a burn, but um, anyway, um, in Ed Catmull's book, he talked about uh, the bone, the emotional bones of a project, and that really inspired me and got me thinking about that. And I've also been reading about creating beat boards and how you do that and haven't been able to figure that out very well. And uh, so let me, let me do a screen share here if I can and uh, here so we can sync these uh, here the sound of my click is the start of the record I think look at that it worked anyway um, yeah so this is uh, the episode one this is a take two that I, I roughed out 10 pages with a different intro based on some feedback just to see if I was on the right track it's probably going to well, I'm sure it'll change more but it probably changed significantly and I experimented a little bit with using the uh, the, the beat board feature in uh, Final Draft and uh, did this little color coding and kind of beat stepping through. And my background as a software engineer, I think that I really want my story to have structure. And I don't know precisely how to do that with a beat board because I feel like I don't, for one thing, know precisely what a beat is, some kind of emotional thing or pivotal thing or significant thing. It seems like everybody has their own little bit of a take on it and I, I just have struggled with it. Um, so I, I kind of wrote 10 pages, uh, alternate, alternate beginning pages, and then went through and cr tried to create this board based on that, and yes, that is a turkey statue. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely critical of the story. Actually, I want it to be critical of the story, but I'm not sure it is yet. Um, and I felt like this was 
not really helpful to me at all. It didn't help me understand the structure of my story. It didn't help me write better scripts. I don't know. Didn't really like it. So then, uh, nope, don't want to show you that yet. Let's go to this one. Then I went to this guy, and uh, so one of my one of my employees uh, led us through a team meeting where he used uh, Jamboard, Google's Jamboard, and I was like, "Ooh, this is sweet. It's collaborative, and it's uh, basically does everything that I think Final Draft would do for a beat board." So I actually went through my entire uh, alternate version two of, of season 101 and created this beat board. <laughs> I guess, I still don't know what a beat is, and why is that not going off? There we go. And I ended up with like, what? what is this? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine wide by five high, 45 beats, if you will. And it's spread across uh, three pages. So I got like going on 150, I think page four is empty, 150 beats. And I don't know if they are actual beats or not, but more importantly, thinking about the emotional bones of a story concept, this did not help me. Uh, I felt like it was no more clear to look at this and see how the emotional storyline went. I can't look at this and go, character A is like somehow having this emotional journey, while character B is having that emotional journey. This is what they're trying to get. This is their driving, whatever. I don't even know. It didn't help me and really frustrated me that I put all this work in to create this and still I have no idea. Now, uh, one thing that I did get out of this was I think what I would have gotten through from just simply going through the story again. And that is every time I go through it, there's little things like, oh, well, that doesn't make sense because of this. Maybe I should consider, you know, that kind of thing. I, I did get some of those things out. So I think any exercise that takes you back through the story can be helpful. But in terms of coming up with a high level structure for the story and being able to move pieces around and see how they relate, didn't help. So then I met with my uh, mentor uh, two days ago, and he showed me how he had done a, uh, I guess we could, he called it a breakdown, um, and that's what, nope, I moved it, that's what this is. And uh, this is not done, this is a work in progress, but what I basically did is took all of the beats that I identified over here in uh, the Jamboard and just moved them over to this beat column, one after the other. He does this breakdown with the episode, the sequence, kind of a high level sequence. Um, you mentioned that you can identify when act one, act two, so on and so forth start. I don't get acts yet, I really don't. That's probably a really bad thing. But I tried, based on the little bit I do know, trying to think of where they started. Um, I'm gonna sneeze, I feel it coming, oh dear. Nope, I got it, okay. And uh, then a sequence is broken down into scenes and then finally the scene gets broken down into beats. Um, and once again, I still don't quite know what a beat is, but uh, somehow this format, knowing that a beat is something smaller than a scene, although I think you might argue that a beat could transcend more than one scene, but I guess you'll copy it twice, I don't know. It hasn't been a problem for me yet. So the idea is uh, to, to organize this thing here so that you essentially have a, a structure these guys here all belong to this scene. Uh, these guys here all belong to this sequence. And of course, all the sequence all the way down, uh, because I've only done one episode 101 so far here, belong to this episode. So that, when one cool thing is you can have multiple episodes all on one page. I think that's kind of helpful because the intersection between two episodes feels fuzzy to me. Where do you end one? Where do you pick up the other? What? There's some stuff that you can move around. Anyway, um, yeah, so I'm just gonna talk through a brief little bit of this and why, uh, I guess read through it, talk about why I, I like this format. Um, so, uh, Happy World. Uh, this is a story about uh, four friends, four, four kids, and how uh, their world gets turned up upside down because of virus strikes. So I wanted to start out by setting the tone that these are four friends, that they are living a very happy life and um, they love being together and uh, there's, you know, there's a relationship there that, that they value. They're, they're living in a happy world and I show that by showing four friends playing tag, which um, this is based on, on my own children and some of their friends and this is absolutely something they do. I know it doesn't have to be real, it just has to be compelling, but 
I use my kids for inspiration, I guess. Uh, so one of the characters, Emily, is it. Um, she's counting. Um, I don't go into detail here as to what that is. I could if I felt like it was an important note, but um, I wanted Emily to be it because, um, and I don't even know if it's reflected here. I wanted her to be the one that's trying to find everybody and everybody else comes running back with her not having found them and maybe feeling a little frustrated because they were moving while they're playing. Uh, actually, it's, it's hide and go seek tag. Uh, whoops, hide and go seek tag. So of course they're gonna move, but if she thought it was just hide and go seek and everybody's moving around, that would drive her nuts. Um, just to create a little bit of a sense of that there's a power differential. She's one of the younger kids uh, and she is uh, smart and powerful in her own right, but she can also feel sometimes taken advantage of by her older brother if uh, things are difficult or in some cases he's giving her an actual real, real, real hard time. So anyway, she's it. Uh, that's one of my beats. Uh, Walker is about her age, uh, her best friend. And uh, he wants to hide with Travis, who is Emily's brother, but Travis wants to hide alone. Well, he thinks he does. I want to establish Walker as feeling a bit unwanted. He's like this really, really smart um, kid who is maybe just a little too smart to be cool. Uh, but part of the storyline is that he ends up being really, really central to uh, these kids figuring out how to beat the virus uh, or detect the virus because um, because he's that smart, quirky kid that knows a lot of random facts, and some of those come together to really help. Travis uh, and Sage hide together and share an awkward moment. So there's a little bit of feelings between these young teenagers. Um, and I think that what I haven't explicitly spelled out here, and maybe I should, but again, it's in the script, and I think I won't forget it, so maybe I don't need to, uh, is that uh, this little thing where Travis doesn't want to hide with Walker and kind of tells him to go find his own place to hide and then he is like fine and he runs off to go hide somewhere else and uh, and then uh, he runs and hides behind these bushes and Sage happens to be there and suddenly he's not bothered anymore he's like ah oh, you know can I hide with you that's cool and then they share this eyes locked moment before they look away and just to establish that there's a little bit of they're to that age where you start liking people and a little romantic tension if you will although I don't think they really recognize it yet. Uh, so anyway, um, that's the kind of idea to step through with those key points. And, I, and it, I couldn't tell you what a beat is, but it starts to feel like it's like there's some emotional thing. There's something that helps us understand a character better, uh, or part of their journey, uh, part of the story that is a beat, and it gets broken down into these scenes. So, uh, so I could, if I wanted to, just hide that whole beat column and then just step through my uh, show via the scene level. Four friends play hide and go seek. Uh, that's probably not enough if you don't have a somewhat idea of the story, but if you do, you know exactly what that is and you can go, okay, so that happens. And then Kent finishes his work day. Kent's the dad of Travis and Emily and heads out to pick up his kids. Okay, well that makes sense. So the kids are playing and dad leaves work and goes to pick them up. Uh, Kent arrives to pick up his kids. Um, here's where I'm writing for someone else because I know whose kids are, but anyway. Uh, Heather, who is the mother of Sage and Walker, is there. The kids and Heather realize something's wrong. So Kent, on his drive, uh, and as he's leaving work, realizes that there's some, some news. Some whispers in the wind, if you will, that uh, this virus is worse than the government's well letting on. And this virus is worse than COVID. So instead of telling everybody to be really, really careful, the government's actually basically not wanting people to panic because it thinks that virus plus panic is worse. And Kent has got a whiff of that and decides to uh, pick up his kids and tell him you're never going to go back. Anyway, that's getting deep into the story. I could talk about it a lot. I'm really excited about it, and I've only worked through what I'd call Act 1 here since I put it in this format, and already I feel like, uh, I feel like I've actually found something that I can use, and it's going to help me develop the emotional buttons of the story. I'm really looking forward to getting through the rest of it, and I'll probably go ahead and trans translate uh, what I wrote for episode two into this format so that I can make sure I get that transition right, and then I'll drop back in and rewrite episode one. I'm not yet sure if I'm going to allow myself to copy-paste from previous versions. 
I think there's a lot that's still the same. I don't know. But then again, there's like certain little things that you want to emphasize. You realize that maybe this thing that felt really important isn't so important. And I don't know, like if you change those priorities a little bit, maybe it would affect the voice. Probably it's best to rewrite it, but I'm not sure I will. Anyway, uh, I'm at the beach today and my kids have been out enjoying the sun and I was out with this uh, ready rig and running to trying to film them and looking like an absolute idiot on the beach uh, with a bunch of other people all socially distanced and me walking around with this massive camera rig. Uh, this lady uh, and her, some guy with her, I guess I don't know what the relationship is. Like, uh, so what kind of film are you making? <laughs> I don't know. I feel conspicuous enough, uh, and I'm proud of myself for being willing to be conspicuous enough. I'm an extrovert, and I usually like it, but in that context, it didn't feel good. And I just said, I don't have enough money for a cell phone. <laughs> anyway, got a laugh out of it. Uh, I think that's all. Um, yay for me for doing number three. And uh, maybe next week, we'll be in a place where we actually have a cool episode starting to come together, and I'm really hoping that we can move on to kind of producing this thing, planning a production. That would be awesome. That's all. Um, bye.